I call my uh, colleague Maria Luisa Dizzone to present Professor Barolini. I would like to take this opportunity, since I assume that all of you are Dante lovers, um, that uh, we are going to start this March, on March 27, a series of uh, global symposia on Dante that will feature uh, all the works of Dante leading up to uh, 2021, correct? We don't know that. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, and uh, we are going to start on March 27 uh, with an, an international symposium dedicated to monarchia. Uh, the symposium will be held both here at Casa Italiana at New York University and at the Italian Academy for Advanced Studies at Columbia University. So it's going to be the morning, the morning here mm -hmm. and the afternoon at Columbia. So mark your calendar for March 27. And keep in mind that this is only the beginning of a series of symposia that every year uh, will feature a work by Dante. The two co-directors of this uh, global series of seminars on Dante are Professor Barolini and Professor Ardizzone. And without further ado, I would like to ask uh, Professor Maria Luisa Ardizzone to introduce our distinguished guest. Thank you. Grazie Stefano. It is my privilege this evening to introduce Professor Teodolinda Barolini. Teodolinda Barolini, the Ponte Professor of Italian at Columbia University, is widely recognized as one of the best scholars of Dante, both in this country and in Europe. Also widely recognized is the fact that her book, <coughs> The Divine Comedy, The Theologizing Dante, Princeton 1992, has changed the whole pattern of Dante's criticism in the U.S. Barolini's research focuses on 13th and 14th century Italian literary culture, its relation to classical antiquity and its reception through the century to our own day. Her publications include Dante's Poets, Textuality and Truth in the Commedia, 1984, Italian Translation, Il Miglior Fabbro, Dante i Poeti della Commedia, 1993. I cannot say all the publishers, but I will not <laughs> there is no time. Um, sorry. Um, la Commedia sen no, sorry. Yes. La Commedia Senza Dio, Dante la creazione di una realtà virtuale, is the translation of uh, the Divine Comedy, the, the, the Theologizing Dante. Uh, published in 1992. Dante and the Origins of Italian Culture, it translated in Italian in uh, the, Il Secolo di Dante, published at first in English in 2006 and then in Italy in 2012. Barolini is the editor of three volumes, Medieval Constructions in Gender and Identity, essays in, on, in honor of John Ferrante, and co-edited with the wine story Dante for the New Millennium, 2003, and Petrarch and the Textual Origins of Interpretation, 2007. In 2009, she has published the first volume of her commentary to Dante's lyrics, Rime Giovanili e della Vita Nuova, Rizzoli. The expanded the revised English edition was published by the University of Toronto Press in 2014, is the book about which we are going to discuss this evening. Uh, she is a fellow of the American American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the Medieval Academy of America from 1997 to 2003, to 2003 Professor Barlolini has been president of the Dante Society of America. She is now working on the volume two of her commentary to Dante's lyrics for Rizzoli. Ongoing projects include also books on Petrarch as a metaphysical poet and the gender the history of early Italian literature. Join me, join me please in welcoming Professor Teodolini.
Okay, we have organized this evening in the following way. I have prepared nine questions for Professor Barolini, and because Dante's three and nine <laughs> is a number which matches with the general situation of this evening. Okay, so Professor Barolini should give answer to these questions. I start with the first one. So what do you want to do? Probably yes, but yes. you should ask your question at the podium. Ask your question. Jacqueline Risset, <laughs> the French scholar and Dante translator, in talking about uh, your critical activity and achievements, has underlined your philological approach to Dante studies as, a, as well as your original mode of criticism. I would like to start with the general question. Why is Teodolinda Barolini, author of The Divine Comedy, The Ideologizing Dante, among other books, interested in publishing a new edition of Dante's Rime? Is there a continuity between your book on the Commedia and the edition of the Rime? This is my question. Thank you, Professor Artizzone, for that question. And, but I think I should thank, I have to thank first also Professor Ardizzone for inviting me, Professor Albertini for hosting this event, Professor Ballerini for first bringing me to NYU, but most important for publishing this volume in English because this, I found, was a very hard volume to get published. Um, I approached Oxford because this is really taking the place of the Foster and Boyd edition of the 1960s. And they said, that's just too expensive. Um, so I am indeed very, very grateful to Professor Ballerini for providing a home to such a volume, which is an expensive kind of volume because it's got critical commentary and text and translation. And it's, a, uh, it's, it's something that is very important that people continue to support because it, it's not even for me, it was not straightforward to get this published, and I say even for me just because I'm old. And so, you know, one sort of, at a certain point, thinks, okay, this will happen. It, I, I'm not quite sure it could have happened without um, this Lorenzo del Ponte Italian Library and with Luigi's support. So, I wanted to say those things. And to everybody for being here, many people I know and uh, see so many faces, um, I'm looking forward to talking to you after. Um, a person who's not here tonight is Richard Lanzi, who is the translator of the poems. And so I just will let you know that up at Book Culture in April, we're going to have a uh, presentation which is going to be more focused on the translation, and Richard will come. And But I do want to tell you that while for me, um, well, I think one of the best things I did was invite Richard to do these translations of the poems. Have you, have uh, you read yeah, him? He's really incredibly good, is he not? Yeah. So, so he had done a translation of the Convivio, but nothing, I think, shows what was going to be his facility and his felicity as a poetic translator. It's not one that I have. I can do a literal translation, but never could I get the sprightly, poetic-sounding um, diction that Richard has in his translation. So that's uh, a feature of this volume that I simply want to state, and it's not what we're going to discuss tonight, but it is a wonderful feature of, of the volume. So why did I want to do this? In the 1990s, Maria Rosa Bricchi, who was then at Bur, the Biblioteca Universale di Soli, contacted me, and she very persuasively uh, went about cajoling me into doing a commentary to Dante's lyric poetry. And she even came to New York. I'm sure she was here to meet with other people too, but we met. And basically she told me this was really something that, that I should do. And I never thought of myself as doing an edition. I am not doing an edition here in the technical sense of the word. This, the edition in the sense of the collation of the manuscripts and the determination of the lexio is de Robertis's, though every now and then I respectfully do not take his lexio, as in Guido io vorrei che tu e l'acqua e And what I try to show there also is 
there's a whole huge discussion, which if it could become a topic tonight, but I don't think I will let it, of when philologists interpret. <laughs> and, and that was a very good example of a pure interpretation that De Robertis did. And, and I just I just couldn't, I didn't see any philological basis for the change of the lexio, so I didn't accept it. But on the whole, this is De Robertis' text, and this is not an addition in the technical sense, but in English we use the word both ways. But this is a commentary. But even as a commentary, it has some properties of an editor because Dante did not put his lyrics in an order. So I had to make decisions about the order, and those are properties of an editor. And Therein lies a huge tale, but I don't know if I should go into that right now. Okay. The, the second question. Yes. Okay. The Italian edition of Rime della Giovinezza della Vita Nova was published so. in 2009. The English edition has recently come out, October of, 20, of uh, 2014. What are the most important additions, if any, in this edition? Thank you. Okay. So this is the Italian that came out in 2009. This is the one that uh, came out in 2014. The, dish, uh, the, the differences are immense, and even those who prefer to read it in Italian, there are benefits to the English, one of which is the extraordinary index, which I am very grateful to Grace Del Molino. And in fact, Grace Del Molino is one of the, one of the differences, because I didn't have anybody to help me copy edit this. So to receive, this looks very small, but it was over 500 pages. And this one is truly daunting because it has what the English doesn't have for reasons of space, which is line notes under the poems also. And those were done by Manuela Granulati. And so this was an extraordinary labor. The freelance Rigatore whom Rizzoli gave this task was valiant. He did it by night while teaching in the day to support his little, he told me about his one-year-old daughter. We, I was up all night, every night, while he was we were doing these emails. But say Gidi di Bozze, and an amazing number of errors remained in it. And the first thing I wanted to do in the English is get rid of the errors. So that was, that was one thing. But then it turned out to be much longer. And today, I actually, um, I was unable to, to get the PDF to tell me what the word count was. I don't know, there must be a way Grace would tell me how to, but. 300,000? Well, in, I can tell you megabytes. In English, it's 2.7 megabytes, and in Italian, it's 1.9. So it got, it got considerably longer, and that's without all the, the line notes. And it got longer because it was 20 years later. And I had started this in the 1990s, and so it becomes less different the two become less divergent uh, as interpretations as you go forward in time. But going back to the, in the first half in particular, I just simply had learned so much more. And I had learned so much more because I had done the Italian. And I couldn't bear not to factor that into the new opportunity that they have. So I, I would have to say in this case, I think of the English one as the qualitatively better one. Um, simply for those reasons. If, God willing, volume two occurs, they will happen more simultaneously, and I don't expect them to be as divergent. I mean, if there's, there will be an English one, if I'm hoping. It's all right. Well, OK. But, but this time, <laughs> well, we all have to still be here. I intend, this time, I, <laughs> I have a different plan of action for this one, which is I'm going to write it in English first. And I'm actually going to have an Italian translated into Italian. It also, I mean, I'm very glad to have had the experience of writing it in Italian. Anybody who picks up the Italian will read, will realize immediately that it sounds like me and that it is me. But that certainly added time to the effort. In your introduction, in your introduction, you offer a learned and brief resume of the methods of the organization of the Corpus of Rime in the historical printed editions. You start with the Juntina edition of 1527 and continue with the 20th century editions of Barbie, Contini, De Robertis, Foster Boyd, up to your own of 2009 and 14. 
you underline the method utilized by Barbie and Contini in which the poems of Rime are organized chronologically and that introduced by the Robertis who chooses instead in his organization to look at the history of the transmission of the text. In these editions, the number of poems included changes according to the criterion that has been chosen. A third model is that of Foster Boyd, who inserts all the text. Their corpus is in fact formed by 89 poems. They also include the texts that are in the Vita Nuova, but not as something for itself, rather they disseminate these poems among the others in order to create a stylistic and chronological pathway. Would you summarize for us your criteria for organizing Dante's Rime? Thank you. So here is where the handout comes in. So I, I already explained to you that I was approached by Rizzoli in the 1990s. One of the reasons that my path was enormously slowed down is because in 2002, De Robertis published something that Contini had originally hailed in 1965. But my ill fortune was that he published it right while I was trying to do this, or my good fortune. Anyway, De Robertis published the, the great five volume edition in 2002. And when I opened it, I was shocked because I saw that he had put aside the efforts of Barbie, and especially Barbie, but followed by Contini, to, tr to try to trace Dante's poetic itinerary in his lyrics, which is really the only place we can trace it. So he put that endeavor completely aside, and instead he decided to be faithful to the tradition. To be faithful to the tradition, which might sound salutary, is really a very problematic decision to make because it means being faithful to Boccaccio. Now, I happen to love Boccaccio, but Boccaccio is not the person to whom to give the task of organizing Dante's theme. Boccaccio has, has his own. Uh, view of things and his own access to write. When I say he gave it to Boccaccio, it's because Boccaccio did, a, did a, a huge, wonderful, Boccaccio did many great editorial services. One, I mean, he, he transcribed the Commedia more than once, and he transcribed the Vita Nuova, and he, he transcribed some of Dante's lyric poems. In fact, he transcribed the Canzoni, that he calls, he refers to them at the end of the transcription, he puts qui finiscono le canzone di Stese di Dante. And from that expletive of Boccaccio comes the phrase you might have seen, le canzone di Stese, which is a reference to the 15 canzoni that Boccaccio transcribed. And they are the first part of your handout. So when I opened De Robertis' edition, and I saw that it began with Cosina mio parlar. Now, Cosina mio parlar, which is one of the Petrose, we can date, because of the astrological periphrasis in Io son venuto, we can date it to around 1296. And to me, it was appalling, appalling, that when we know that Donne Chiavete was written earlier, it, 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 it would be placed, well, in the case of Donne Chiavete, it wasn't placed anywhere at all. Why? Why isn't it in? the Società Dantesca edition of the, of the Rime, because it happens to belong to the Vita Nuova. Because Dante made the decision to put it in the Vita Nuova, even though it was circulating independently and we know about its prior existence, it doesn't go into the edition of the Rime. Anyway, when I saw the first 15 poems were the Canzone di Stese, and then I studied it, and I saw that what that what the tradition was, was a mixture of grafting of the Giuntina onto Boccaccio. The Giuntina is the first printed edition. That's the next thing on your handout. It, it's 1527. And you will see that the, um, the editors of the Giuntina, the Giunti brothers of Florence, keep the Vita Nuova poems. Actually, in some ways, they do a better job than some later editors. They at least keep them present, as if you may even though by keeping them as a block, 
poems of the Vita Nuova, they, they also signify that it's, it's a special uh, situation. But okay, at least they're there. So when I saw what De Robertis had done, I was, I was, I was sidetracked because I felt I had to write something about that. And I wrote an essay that I think would qualify as Critica Militante that was published in 2004 by Lettere Italiane by our beloved compianto Vittore Branca, who was a good friend of De Roberti's, and I have to give him credit that he published that of mine. And he wrote me, tale, could I just ask you to take out some of those exclamation points? <laughs> and, and he was right, and I did. But um, so that, that piece, which eventually in much less militant form became the basis of the introduction is where I tried to, well, it has a pars destruens and a pars costruens. The pars destruens, I think, is pretty easy to mount. It's a little, I mean, always the pars costruens is harder, but I do believe that I make the case for why any of us who really cares about Dante, and this is also the question of why, what's the continuity between all my work and this, this commentary? It's because this makes, in the end of Divine Comedy, I talk about the line of becoming, and there I'm talking about the line of the Commedia, the unfolding narratological line, but really the line of becoming is Dante, Dante's own trajectory as a poet. How did he get from being that poet to that poet? That has always been the abiding question for me, and it really it goes through all my work. It's, it's what the Dante's Poets is already dealing with, especially the first chapter on the um, on the poems of his own that Dante cites in the Commedia. So that interest was, was always, always there, and I felt that that interest is something that readers and intellectuals really are always drawn to. How did a poet become? Especially when a poet ends up writing something like the Divine Comedy. How, did, how do you get there? And that's what you completely lose the opportunity to tell if you do not try to reconstruct a chronological arc when you deal with the lyrics. And what I wanted to do, fully knowing that no chronology is perfect, but the fact that the chronology is not perfect because we don't have enough facts to make it perfect is not a reason, in my belief, to throw out the idea of doing our best to tell the story of the becoming. So that, that is the, the fuller answer to to that, so was that, oh no, the Vita Nova, so the Vita Nova. So you see on the big top I have the Canzone di Stese, then I have the Giuntina, you can see how the Giuntina is, is, is subdivided, and then you see the poems from the Vita Nova, thank you, the 13 Vita Nova lyrics that De Robertis includes in his edition. Are then are then the, the final list on the, on the front of your handout. He includes them because they existed in a redaction, material redaction, prior to the Vita Nova. In other words, he can. There is proof, physical, not lost by the vicissitudes of time, that they existed. Now, remember a number of years ago, some of you remember the Cavalcanti conference at the Instituto Italiano di Cultura. Organized by Artizzone. Oh, uh, organized by Artizzone. <laughs> and you remember that, well, anyway, De Robertis was invited because Professor Artizzone that. is a brilliant organizer of conferences, among other brilliant things, and she always brings the best people. And I went to the Instituto, I was there anyway, but I stopped De Robertis and I interviewed him. And I went home and I wrote down everything before I forgot it. And I asked, and I, I begged him, I said, but Professor, you've got to put all the Vita Nuova poems in. He said to me, I consider them all to have been written prior to the Libendo. He said that. He said, maybe, fare forse, forse possibile una eccezione per donna pietosa, but otherwise, all written before the Libendo. I said, well, how can you not put them in? How can you not put them in? I, I'd never met him before. I, I, but I was very passionate about this. We had this encounter. I wrote it all down, and he personally, and I liked the man, 
and I, I actually consider myself one of his great supporters, um, in the sense that if you read my work, you will see it's his Vita Nuova I use. And actually, that's one of the reasons I use Vita Nuova and not the Gornian Vita Nova. I consider Gorni to have bullied De Robertis, and that De Robertis in some way deferred to a person who I do not think wrote nearly as good a commentary to the Vita Nova. Uh, no. Gordney's is belletristic, Thedobertis's is really hermeneutically, as well as ectotically, tough, and with lots of actually extremely still useful, um, very useful material in it. So I don't say this as a criticism of Thedobertis, but rather almost as how remarkably interesting it is always in life and in history, how personalities also are part of things, that he in some ways did not defend his own work. Um, and he uh, allowed in the Rime, it happened, do you remember, this was before you were here, that conference, the first of the international Dante seminars, do you remember um, Gordy came? Maybe it was you the second. You invited him yeah, well, in New York. And yeah. he, we corresponded for quite a while after that, and he told me, if De Robertis will do what I, if he follows me, he will do something truly revolutionary. I think really De Robertis was taken by that down a very wrong path. So the Vita Nuova, you can see the wrong path if you look at this chart, and then this is the end of this handout. I put this chart, not, it's not in the Italian introduction, I put it into the English introduction because I realized that I had to make more evident to the reader how the issue of the Vita Nuova is the coup de midolens for editors of the Rime. So if you just look through this, you will see that the status of the Vita Nuova tells you how the editor feels about things in some ways. Barbie who it became quite fashionable in Italian circles to deride as, as an old-fashioned positivist, I concluded my labors with the greatest respect for him because he is a generous editor. He includes more information, and then you can decide. He's not reticent. He's not withholding. He's truly a generous, generous editor. Now, his vision of De Vita Nuova, he's inclusive. Barbie includes everything that he thinks Dante could ever have written, so he would never leave out Donne Chiavete. However, what he's following is in the path of the Giuntina, Giuntina because he has the Vita Nova poems as a block, and he calls them just the Rime della Vita Nova. If you have ever opened the Contini edition, and you see that they start with the Tenzone with Dante de Maiano, and, that, and you wonder, how did that happen, when at the same time Contini says, that he's exactly following Barbie. The reason is because he's following Barbie, but having removed the Rime della Vita Nuova. So he starts with Barbie's Rime del Tempo della Vita Nuova, which begin with the Tensone with Dante de Maiano. In fact, one of the great things that you would never understand picking up Contini's edition, because it doesn't have divisions into books, is that the order is exactly Barbie's, he continued did nothing with respect to order, he, but he simply removed the Vita Nuova poems and he removed the poems that went into the Convivio. In other words, Contini actually was more, the way I consider it is, more deferential to Dante's authority. Once Dante had put those poems into the Vita Nuova or into the Convivio, they were no longer rime. And I have exactly the opposite attitude. They were written before, and they should be treated, we should do our best to try to treat them also as, as, as <coughs> understanding that they were written before. That's actually difficult. I mean, that was great. I said that to myself, write about the Vita Nuova poems as though they were not put in the Vita Nuova. That did not turn out to be easy. In fact, I had to figure out a method and I, I sat down. The first poem in this that is a Vita Nuova poem is number five, A Ciascun Alma, which is the first poem of the Vita Nuova. And you get a sense of Dato Bertis's inconsistency when I tell you that he puts 14 Vita Nuova poems in his edition, 
the 13 that exist in a prior redaction and a chaspoon alma for no reason at all. So, you know, go figure. Um, I got to a chaspoon alma and I started out with this, okay, I'm going to write about it as though it's not going to be de Couldn't do it. <laughs> How to do it? Well, the only way I, I could do it was to tell what Dante does with it in the Vita Nova and then say, but let's see what of that is actually in the poem. So that, in effect, I ended up having to do a kind of commentary on the Vita Nova because every time I got to a Vita Nova poem, I had to say, this is what happens to it in the Vita Nova, but look what's, what, what of that is there actually in the poem. That was the only way I could, I could figure out to, <coughs> to deal with them. So, I guess that, that is that. This is the last okay. part of my question. Sorry, I don't know if this is question four. You did not give answer already. You have given already answer. I don't know. All right. You can okay. What to do? No, but it's important for this. Can you go ahead? Uh, in your edition, you include all texts that are attributed to Dante with certainty, following a hypothetical chronological order in an attempt to reconstruct, as you write, the ideological history of Rime. Close to Foster Boyd for including the poetic texts of Vita Nuova, your method traces a different pathway when you reproduce two different versions of the same text. Because of it, you follow in part the Robertis 2005, um, and in part you utilize the text of the poems of Vita Nuova as in the Robertis edition of the Libello, in, which is in fact shaped on Barbie's edition. This combination of two different philological approaches, you should stay on that, seems to involve linguistic discrepancies. Could you explain the reasons for your choice, especially in relation to Foster Boyd edition? Okay, so, thank you, Professor Aguizone. So, as I was saying, I greatly deplore De Roberti's decision to omit from the Società Dantesca's edition of the Rime Vita Nuova poems that do not exist in a prior redaction. However, I celebrate his printing of the first redaction the first time that that has been made available outside of a very, very limited philological uh, space. So here, too, I had to do a very complicated dance. What I decided to do, it does lead to inconsistencies, but I didn't see any way uh, to go forward but this. It took me a long time to decide these matters. I decided where, De Robert, where a prior, where a poem exists in, as De Robertis puts it, la sua veste pre vita nuova, in where there is a version existent prior to the vita nuova. I take it from the De Robertis 2002 edition and I, I print it, saying this is, this is as De Robertis prints it. Where it is not, uh, uh, where there does not exist a prior redaction, I take it from De Robertis' edition of the vita nuova. <laughs> That's confusing. I take it from his edition of the Rime when it's the first when it's a prior redaction. I take it from his edition of the Vita Nuova when it's not uh, when it doesn't exist in a prior redaction. The result is that that you have to well. I I explain it all very carefully in the footnotes. I mean in the introduction. And every time I get to a poem that exists in a prior redaction, I I put right right in the, uh, let's see if I can find one. Um, <clears throat> well, Chokin in Contra, if I can find that, that's a good example. Um, which one is, Grace, where's Chokin in Contra? Well, here, okay, I happen to come first at 35. Negli occhi porta la mia donna amore. If you see, I put underneath it, right in the title, first redaction. So 
So the ones that exist in a prior redaction, I'm, I just put it right up. So that means that in a, in a more accessible, with English translation, edition of the Vita Nova, you also have available for the first time something that only has just recently become available to scholars, which is the first redaction for those poems where there is a first redaction. So I think that's, that's another. Uh, now, about the issue of where there are two versions. For two poems, no me podia no, no me podia no jamai fare menga, and the wonderful Lizeta poem, which is probably my favorite in many ways, Per quella via che la bellezza corre, the last poem in the book. For those two, I print two versions of the poem. And I think this is the first edition ever to do that. In the case, well, I mean, Dedo, okay, so, De Robertis prints the two editions of Non Mi Purino. He prints the Bolognese and the Tuscan. And he puts both of them, I believe, in the 2000, I know he puts them both in the 2002 five volume massive scholarly edition, but I believe also in the 2005 condensed one volume divulgativo edition. Uh, that you will find both of them of Noni Purino, the sonnet with the Garizenda uh, tower. The Lizetta sonnet, Per quella via che la bellezza corre, De Robertis does a very bad thing. He gives two versions in the 2002 massive critical edition. One is the edition, is the version of that sonnet with which we become most familiar, in which per quella via che la bellezza corre, uh, I'm just going to see, you read you one thing so you see. Per quella via che la bellezza corre quando a chiamar amor vane la mente, vanne lizetta baldanzosamente. That word lizetta, the name of the protagonist, is how the sonnet is normally referred to. And then in the 2002 edition, <laughs> De Robertis prints also an alternate version in which the name Lizetta is, has become Licenza. Now this is a poem about a, an attempted seduction <laughs> and the, the poet's thwarting of the seduction. And I'm not gonna go to the interpretation right away, but I'm gonna say, in the 2002 edition, we find both versions, and De Robertis writes a long introduction about how both versions are philologically valid. There is no way to choose between them on philological grounds. Lo and behold, in the 2005 Edizione Divulgativa, there is only Vicenza. And I found that so unacceptable. The people, the, the great majority of the readers who don't get the five volume set will find that that poem has been denuded of historicity and really of everything that's fantastic about it. And instead of, Lizetta doesn't even exist. But not only that, what happened to the scrupolo theologico whereby they are both equally valid? Suddenly the, the interpretation has become quite heavy handed and we only find one version. So in that case, also, I print both both versions, but my my introduction to that poem makes clear why Lizetta is really the far far preferable reading. But so that's those are the methodological novelties, I would say. Question five. So these these were all the editorial questions. Yes. Now we, we, we right. so shall we, we take, but shall we take some questions just about these editorial? Since now we're going to go to thematic. Uh, if, okay, okay. I mean, I, look, it's good. if there are specific questions about these editorial matters, maybe it's better to ask them now. I know that they're is very specific. Is they're very specific in there. But if, if you don't want to, that's also fine. But, no, I, I do have yes. a question. Uh, actually, picking up on what you said before, I, I, I see the, the line from the early poems to the Divine Comedy. But is there something specific you can point out in the early lyrics that makes you think theologically, although it de yeah, de theologized you know. theology? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, uh, well, in the in a poem to go yes. all the way back to an extremely young Dante. Let's take a sonnet. Do you, do you mind to repeat the question because a lot of people here couldn't uh, hear it? Professor Ballerini actually is anticipating Professor Ardizzone's next question, which has to do with theology in a way, right? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> all right. All right. Well, Did I say your question correctly? Where do we see? Yeah, I don't want to do some specific textual yes. okay. evidence. All right. So, well, O voi che per la via d'amor passate, okay. which is a poem, a sonnet that's in the Vita Nuova, but that is existing in a first redaction. So here we have a poem that exists prior to the Vita Nuova, absolutely incontrovertibly. And as I just read the, the last section of, of, of my reading, well, o voi che per la via d'amor passate, attendete e guardate, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a commonplace of the commentary tradition that Dante is citing Jeremiah here, and that this mm -hmm. is the Bible. And what we have here is this extraordinary mixture in an extremely young Dante. He takes, o voi che per la via passate, attendete e guardate, which is the translation from Jeremiah, O vos omnes qui transitis per viam, and he adds d'amor. So what I call that is a courtoisification of the Bible. And that kind of move, that incredible mixing of, of, of registers, which is really the hallmark of the Paradiso, mm -hmm. right? I mean, where, where you find, um, in fact, may I give you my, my absolutely favorite example in thinking of the Paradiso? Um, <coughs> So you remember toward the end of the Paradiso, the extraordinary description of the angel Gabriel. It's in Paradiso 32. Now I have to find this, the, the poem where I find the precursor to, to that. So just bear with me one minute because I did not specifically look for this before coming. But you know, this has such a great index that I could probably, <laughs> thanks to Grace over there. Well, I didn't make the index. Well, but you were a big part of, 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 of working on it. Um, that probably we can find Gabriel in the index. Uh-oh, we can't. Okay. Um, Leggiadria, <laughs> Leggiadria, Leggiadria, that will be in the index. You actually do it in Ovoi, Che la via d'amor passate, a little bit. Do I really? Yeah. But, okay. Do I do it already there, mm -hmm. about Gabriel? Page oh, okay, thank you, thank you. That's Akash Kumar, um, another absolutely uh, indispensable person in, in my life. So, um, yes, okay. So, in this O Voi Que Per La Via, at a certain point, uh, Amor says to the, the lover, Or no, somebody who sees how happy he is just says to him, "Per qual di just says per qual dignitade questi così leggiadro lo cor ave." In Richard's translation, "Good Lord, what worthiness confers upon this one so glad a heart?" And I go into an excursus on the word leggiadria, um, pointing out, which was not something I realized until I thought about it from this perspective that Leggiadria is only used one time in the entire Commedia, which is in the description of Gabriel, Baldezza e Leggiadria quante ser puote in angelo ed in alma tutta in, in lui. So that the word of the, tra the trajectory of the word Leggiadria, the line of that word, actually begins in the courtly paradise of a, of a sonnet like this, a sonetto di interzato, and then it reaches that completely other paradise. And that's really, lexical lines like that is one of the things I found most uh, satisfying about this. Okay, maybe this is something on which we can go back again. Uh, your reading is a thematic interpretation that for the first time focuses on the sociological, historical aspects of Dante's poems. <coughs> Here we are. I would stress the originality of your reading by recalling a few poems. 
Among them the most famous Guido Io Vorrei. Here you follow Dante's celebration of friendship, utilizing also the notion of gender. In your Cappello to the poem, you introduce the idea of an unconscious homoeroticism by analyzing Dante's language. language. Although you don't mention his name, your analysis exploits the Lacananian theory that we are spoken or revealed by our language. If it is your idea that both friendship and love are ruled by the desire for fusion. In that you recall the Trinitarian notion of a divine tree that is also one. In your suggested link, you seem to go back to a crucial and basic Neoplatonic Christian formulation. The tree is one because among them the true subject is relation and the true relation is union and identity, according to Thomas Aquinas. Interesting too is the application of the theological to human life. Do you think that this notion could be useful, that is a trinity, could it be useful in the field of gender studies? So there's an awful lot of that in that question. <laughs> Homo homoeroticism, gender, trinity, so, okay. Uh, Professor Artizone prepared these questions still in her beautiful home in Celatica and sent them to me for me to meditate on. And well, I, I did immediately consult the index because I was curious to see if homoeroticism had become something that I talked about to that degree, and it did not make it to the index. However, I knew that I had raised the question, which I raised entirely as a question. Um, I say, um, the authentic privileged space of the sonnet, Guido Ivore, is the male space of the octave. I've, I've been talking, and I do think Dante gets a lot of credit for bringing into the space of that sonnet the uh, ladies who are in the sextet. And I see in that mixed gender brigata a kind of precursor of the Decameron's brigata. One of the things. Okay, all right, I won't <laughs> jump ahead. But um, then, having said that Dante, in my opinion, gets credit for the putting of the ladies into the Vazello, I also, you have to, the, the poem goes down a notch when you get to the sextet. The, 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 the great impact of it is in the is in the octave in my in my opinion and so i say the authentic privileged space of the sonnet is the male space of the sec of the octave before the addition of the ladies is there a latent homoeroticism in this sonnet how why do i say that i'll tell you why because of the word preso i i always just go by the language and i couldn't kind of refute my own <laughs> belief in what preso means in the entire courtly tradition and the word that he uses, um, fossimo presi. I mean, that that is a very that is a very strong word, and that's why I pose the question. That's that's the that's the extent of that. So the next part of that was gender. Okay, gender in the Trinity. Gender goes all the way through this commentary. You brought up the social. Why? Because most of these poems are courtly poems. Courtly poems are always rotating around an access that is gendered. And I actually find it kind of amazing to read courtly poems and manage to never talk about gender, um, which is, which is the, um, the, the tradition, really. So instead of talking about the role of love, I actually try to ground it in terms of how these poems are exploring also issues of gender. This sonnet, I give, uh, again, just following the language. This sonnet is about imagining no impediments between us and imagining a condition of no difference. Theologically, Dante, I don't know to what extent he gave much thought to this, theologically at this point in his life, but certainly theologically, he understood that difference is the is what makes you not a veroistic, among other things. 
and is absolutely essential to a Christian conception of the self and of the soul. But he is drawn, just as in the Paradiso, he's drawn also to, you know, the whole paradox of the Paradiso is in the first terzina, la gloria di colui che tutto muove, but per l'universo penetra e risplende in una parte più e meno altrove. That's the acknowledgement of difference in that last verse. This sonnet is an attempt to not acknowledge difference and to imagine that those three <coughs> grammatically distinct selves of the incipit can be somehow one. That could not help but make me think of the Trinity, and so I, and so I discuss it in those terms, but it did not lead me to think in terms of how to think of gender in a, theo in a theological way. It led, I mean, I'm sure that one could. If I did not go that far. We are close to finish. <laughs> okay, now the, the number is, uh, number six. Another text in which you discuss gender is Sonat Bracchetti in which you introduce a dichotomy between masculine and feminine and identify as feminine, love, and as masculine, the hunt. You usually link gender to country society, as you say. What about the notion of gender in the theological field? It is my impression that it could work, for instance, in the canzone Donne che avete intelletto d'amore, in which Beatrice appears to be provided of a double identity, as a Madonna, a lady, and there's a Christ, a man. So, so that's a very good example of Professor Ardizzone taking the suggestions and going in a fascinating direction that was not... My direction. Yes, <laughs> and, but that's what everybody hopes to do. That's certainly what I hope to do. I, I hope to start people on many, many paths, and I appreciated that. It wasn't something that I had thought of, and I thought it was a fascinating direction in which to move. Okay, so this would be maybe the right answer because you suggest something and we move with you further. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think this I, is the, the right thing okay. to do. Okay, uh, I like your answer. Uh, <laughs> seven, regender. I wanted to remind that you have discussed the gender at length in the final section of your Dante and the Origins of Italian Literary Culture. In particular, the final chapter proposes a programmatic, uh, programmatic issue, not toward the gender and the history of Italian literature. Could you, uh, you speak also about Beatrice, could you explain how it is possible to create a gender and the history of Italian literature? Well, it was a, a, an idea that I worked out for the very early stages, and again, that I was just sort of throwing out there with the thought that maybe somebody would want to take it further um, in the future. But in again, it came out of, of um, uh, thinking about uh, cortesia. And one of something I, I, I couldn't help but notice is that the poems that in my youth I always thought of as the least attractive of Dante's poems, like Dolia Mireka, where he's very paternalistic in his attitude toward women, are in fact, when I came back to them years later, I realized they were more progressive because he is in a dialogue with women. Even the fact that he's trying to teach them something in a paternalistic way is still, from a certain perspective, a more progressive attitude than the uh, putting them on a pedestal in the courtly tradition in which the woman never speaks is never, and is only there as a function of ennobling the man. It was, it was that that started me thinking about this. It was, it was thinking about um, how the Guitone d'Arezzo, another extremely paternalistic and annoying person <laughs> in some respects. <laughs> but in others, I began to say, oh, an entire poem uh, devoted to what you would have to call women's issues. It, that makes him, uh, I think, a precursor to, so I basically ended up saying that there, you could look at the early Italian tradition in terms of a more progressive filone, which is the one that goes from Guitone to Dante to Boccaccio, really. 
where the whole question of, of utility and trying to instruct women, and this is what the last chapter of this book is our um, And as compared to the Platonizing tradition that has all the beautiful poems that I loved so much when I was young, that I think are actually less progressive than many, from a gender, from, a, from the point of view of, of making women interlocutors and actually bringing them into a discursive space. That, that's what, what that idea is. Um, there was another point I wanted to make about that. Um, well, um, sort of losing it, I'm not quite, oh, which is, of course, that another, I adore Petrarch, but Petrarch is regressive. <laughs> and the fact is that in the Canzoniere, there is no poem in which he talks to women the way Buitone does or the way Dante does in a poem like Dolia Mireka. So, histories don't just go in one direction. That's something we also just know from being alive. Things go back and forward. They go in many different ways. And this was an attempt to look at this part that I've worked on my entire life and think of it from, from this perspective. One, and then this is a question of methodology. I love it when I find some kind of proof that is contemporary. And here my friend was Cecco Dascoli, who is a very interesting character. In 1327, he was burned at the stake. He was a doctor and uh, an astrologer. And he wrote a scientific poem, not very good poetry, but very, very interesting, called Acerba, a cosmology, a cosmografia, in Latin, in Italian, excuse me. Um, in the Acerba, one of the most fascinating things about the Acerba is the way in which he interacts with Dante, who he clearly thinks did an inferior work to his because Dante has all these characters in it and all this narrative. And he, Cecco, is doing the proper scientific philosophical. One of the things he takes Dante to task for is the canzone Doglia Mireca. And he takes him to task for <coughs> addressing women. And he says, women have no intellect. What does Dante think he's doing talking to them? That it's like looking for the Virgin Mary in Ravenna to address women. Now, that was an enormous conforto to my thesis because it showed me that that paternalism of Dolia Mireka, we might at first blush consider obnoxious. Cecco thought of it as way too liberal in that it, it and he says it. He says it straight out. He says, what does he think he's doing, actually addressing women? So that kind of, uh, if I can find some kind of historical context, uh, that always makes me feel better. I would like to recall the sociological aspects that you underline in Dante, in particular the sociology of Brigata. You have pointed out in your work in Dante's Rime, the sense of social groups as something new, new. You focus on the Brigata, for instance, as a group composed of men and women, a point to the theme of friendship, which implies <coughs> not only a philosophical friendship, <coughs> but also a social history. The sociology of Brigata, you write, is evident in several <coughs> of the sonnets. Many texts you continue that have been, re I think this is very important what you said about that, that you have been re read as texts of love's ideology are documents of, of moments of social life. Could you say more about these small social entities in which way you link social history and the gender? Okay. So here I'm, um, for some reason, I just, I have to bring Professor Ballerini in. Again? Yeah, I do. <laughs> because it has to do with that way that we talked about years ago that things can seem uncannily like like you can almost for a second touch what it would be to be there. And that was the experience I had writing on writing these poems was that every now and then I would get a feeling like some distant, distant almost feel and I said this it was it made me think of you and the way you would talk about poetry. And I think that in the book in your honor, I, I actually, yeah, 
So it is connected in my mind for a reason, right? It is. All right, so that feeling, these poems are stylized, many of them, courtly. Always the tradition is to talk about them in terms of love. It is true that real life is very filtered out of them deliberately. That's what the program of the Steel Novel is, say, compared to Buitone, right? Um, we, as critics, are accustomed to looking at the Vita Nuova and seeing the degree of life history that enters into the prose that is not in the poems. <coughs> it was surprising to me. It's one of the things that changed over the 20 years that I, I couldn't keep it keep at bay the fact that I was seeing history in the poems. Also, it's harder to see it, but it's not not there. And maybe I'll just give you one example. Two sonnets that went into the Vita Nuova, which are uh, the two sonnets Se uh, tu colui and voi donne. Say to Kului, I'm just going to find it. I, I think I wrote the page down for myself somewhere. Another example of what I'm talking about, that feeling of a frisson of history, is um, the sonnet Di Donne Io Vidi Una Gentile Schiera. I'm going to, I'll give you that example <coughs> first. I'm just going to give these two examples and that's it. So, di donne io vidi una gentile schiera, which you can also discuss in terms of the, of a brigata of female characters, in which I do discuss in those terms, so that's going towards <coughs> the, the sociology of the brigata, but the point I want to make now is that after that first line, di donne io vidi una gentile schiera, questoni santi prossimo passato. Now, that's amazing. This day of all saints that's just passed. That doesn't belong in a Steel Novo poem. Somehow nobody ever said that before, but it doesn't because it's too concrete, it's too historical. It's telling you something about a moment. This All Saints Day prossimo passato, it's, it's, it's one of those things that just gives you goosebumps, really, when you, when you think about it. And when you think about the way it takes the Steel Novo and it already brings history in it. And again, this is the line of becoming. The line of becoming is toward history for Dante. He wrote the Commedia. <laughs> he wrote the most incarnate historical poem. And you can already feel that in Questo mi santi prossimo passato. Uh, the other example that I would give you just off the cuff is the two sonnets that go into the Vita Nuova in the section where Dante is describing Beatrice's being very sad because a relative of hers has died. And what I began to realize, and if you look at, these are 37 and 38, in 37, I have a long quote from Davidson, Storia di Firenze, on the ritual practices of mourning. Because I began to realize that these sonnets are really extraordinarily anthropologically precise in terms of gender behavior, what women are supposed to do, what Dante actually does in these sonnets. Little sonnets nobody really ever talked. I mean, this is why this took so long, is because everywhere I found much more that was interesting than I expected to find. Um, and. So these little sonnets, Dante is imagining that he is able to invade the, the space of female mourning, not M-O-R, but M-O-U-R, and that he can transgress that gender boundary and be in there mourning and weeping with them. And there's actually four sonnets devoted to this. Two made it into the Vita Nuova, two did not. I treat them all in a row. That's the beauty of just throwing the Vita Nuova poems in there. You get to see them in their, in their context. And one of the things he does is he dramatizes in this one, Se tu colui, 
he dramatizes the women in his imagination responding to his transgression and reprimanding him. And they say, Lascia piangere noi, e triste andare. Leave weeping and unhappiness to us. That's our job. That's Richard's translation. Richard is fantastic, but Richard cares about meter. So triste andare is actually talking about processional walking, which is why I have the, the quote from Davidson on processions, funeral processions in, in Florence at the time. That's what he's evoking there. He's evoking a sociology of the corrotto, of funeral practices. And that's the kind of thing that is there for all of you, I'm talking now to the younger people here, so much to discover. That's really, I mean, you can take it toward gender and theology. You can take it any way you want. There's just so much to discover. What I was just amazed by is uh, the big message, the takeaway, is these poems are underinterpreted. Yeah. They're underinterpreted. I had to spend a lot of time dealing with philology because I had to make myself credible. But once I've gained that credibility, what I really want to do is be a interpreter. And I want to tell you, there is so much here to interpret. That's that's really the message. You don't have to speak about the brigata way that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to now. Oh, okay. <laughs> that, this is the last question. You are probably the only medieval and Dante scholar who publishes not only in the US but also in Italy and here with both with the best Italian editors and publishers. Your books stay on the shelves of the most important bookshops in Italy. For instance, Feltrinelli and close for alphabetical reasons to our back studies on Dante. And while Traditionally, your work has been highly praised by Ezio Raimondi, among the others. Your Italian edition of Rime has created various reactions. An Italian scholar has devoted 25 pages of the Rivista di Studi Danteschi to a discussion of your book. Because of the importance given to your work, it seems that your Dante's Rime has generated a kind of apprehension in Italy among scholars because according to some of them you are introducing cultural lines of thought that are foreign to the Italian tradition and to the model of learning taught in the Italian universities. How would you like, would you comment on this assertion? Okay, so in a way I'm not sure since I just did a very uplifting <laughs> Maybe we should just end with that uplifting moment. I can do this, but then I have to go negative. And Why and not? Go. It's sort, of, it's sort of a shame, isn't it? I mean, I let, let everybody take the uplifting message. If you want me to go negative. All right. So, actually, I'll try to put this in an uplifting way, too. The, the introduction to this book, Dante and the Origins of Italian Literary Culture, which is the collection of the essays I'd written prior to this point, this came out in 2006, is called Reading Against the Grain, Musings of an Italianist from the Astral to the Artisanal. And you know, one of the things that's always amazing to me is why people just repeat each other. It just seems to be more interesting to try to think of a different, different way to approach something. So, apprehension, undoubtedly I can see that the very use of the word gender is, 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 is something that causes apprehension in terms of discussing these poems. But in fact, the apprehension pre predated my commentary, which didn't come out until 2009. And I'm going to cite you something to show that. This is from Gorney's defense of De Robertis' edition, written before I had gotten into this debate at all. He, in his defense, which he wrote kind of a priori, as an immediate coming to make sure that nobody would dare to say that this edition was completely wrong-headed, he writes, he worries that its difficulties are such that it will be poorly received 
specie al estero e presso chi guarda alla filologia come un mondo a sé, especially among those foreigners and those who look at philology as a world to itself. In other words, he had circled the wagons before I ever came into the discussion. Why is that? I'm just going to read you this little section. What an odd remark. This is me now. With its suggestion, and this was published in 2004. Okay, with its suggestion, <coughs> despite the example of Foster and Boyd from the 1960s, that the outside world will fail to understand a philological contribution to the editorial history of Dante's Rime. The, scru the scrupulous contribution of Foster and Boyd shows us that the tradition has transcended national boundaries, has, has long been the case with the Commedia. But most of all, Gordon in saying that seems to forget, this is really interesting, at least to me, that De Robertis' innovation, if it can be called that, is not based on philology. As Gordney well knows, the innovations of the De Robertis edition are, and this is Gordney, di ordinamento piuttosto che di lezione, di forma piuttosto che di sostanza. Well, the ordinamento of the rime is not susceptible to a philological solution. It is an interpretive question. So my point is that there was already an, an amazing amount of defensiveness built into the rime establishment, maybe because it had remained sort of behind. It had been left. It was the last part of Dante's studies that was just completely behind a philological barricade. And one of the things that really, and now I'm going to go back to uplifting, <laughs> I found my way back trying to make these poems accessible to readers, both in Italian and in English, who, do, who, who, who don't want to be stopped. I try, try to make the philology not be in their way. But at the same time, I deal with it, so it can't be said that I haven't dealt with it. But then I try to put it there enough for, for, the, for, for the reader and then go on to the poem. And somehow that was, I think that does cause a certain amount of apprehension. On the other hand, I would have to say that from when I was a graduate student and teaching myself the rime, because there were no courses on things like that, that he may seem to have become awfully popular, and if I don't get my second volume done, <laughs> at this point someone else will do it, because that he may have suddenly become, but that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case even 20 years ago. So something has, has happened, and I think good. it's good. Thank you, Professor Barolini, for such a high intellectual performance. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, I think that prob probably Professor Barolini will accept questions from the people who are in this room. I will. I will. Um, if there are questions, so you are welcome. Okay. <coughs> Michael. Yes. I have a very specific question and a very general one. Uh, the specific one you sort of left us dangling on the word on the verb preso, you know, in the um, <laughs> uh, in the Stil Novo tradition, and I was wondering if you could uh, substantiate a little better, you know, just uh, say what it means oh. in the Stil Novo, because I'm not familiar with it. Oh, oh, uh, amor mi prese, Giacomo da Lentini. Mm -hmm. I mean, prendere, and that's why when Dante in Inferno 5 has Francesca using that verb, that is a technical verb, like stringere. It's a verb of, that connotes sexual passion, period. Mm -hmm. that, that's what it, what it connotes in the Italian courtly tradition going back to Giacomo. <coughs> so I, I document that all in that essay, Dante and Cavalcanti. Mm -hmm. um, just give you a whole line of them. Um, mm -hmm. So the problem that was being posed in Guido e Vore is it's not possible for Dante to use the past participle presi without any sense of it having, it seems to me, I don't know, what it, do you it's, think? It's plausible, it's a donna e Teresa, I mean, also in the, in the exchange of uh, sonnets, there's quite a number of cases in which the word Teresa comes to the surface and it means what it means. You know? Right, so, but it, we know that it means that in a heterosexual context in courtly poetry, but I wasn't entirely <laughs> 
what I actually surprised, I had never focused on Bossimo Prezi <coughs> in We Do You Bure. I'd never focused on it. When I focused on it, I couldn't allow myself off the hook. And so I felt I had to put in that question consistent with my interpretation of the word elsewhere. Um, that's that's what how that works. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I, I sort of figured that, but uh, I, you know, in a, so much of your work. I will just, send you all the chapter and verse if you want okay. it. I mean, <laughs> and I guess that sort of leads to my second question because I mean I, I kind of just intuited that that's what it meant. Um, but I was also feeling a kind of a reluctance to jump into interpretation because of your methodology itself, <laughs> um, which, you know, in your work on Dante, in your work on Petrarca, I don't know the work on Boccaccio, I'm afraid, um, but there's a great emphasis on order, on somehow sweeping away a hermeneutic tradition of sorts in order to get at whatever ordering principle the poet himself might have had, you know. and. I don't know whether that's sort of like an argument against interpretation, saying that this is the kind of work we have to establish the, the text and the context before we can even begin to get into the issue of interpretation. But on the other hand, you could look at individual poems and people might just be sort of interpreting them as well. And so personally, yeah. what gives, it's just kind of been a cross I have to bear <laughs> that I have to keep doing the sweeping away and the methodological part. I like to do the interpretation. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part. That's what those introductory uh, essays are. And if I had my brothers, you would all have read a lot of poems, and then we could just discuss specific mm -hmm. poems and interpret them. Mm -hmm. That's why the rime, that's how I would like it to be as, as part of the global. Because I'm personally tired of the methodological, of expounding it. I just like to do it at this point. I mean, there's just so much. I mean, for instance, a poem like Posha Kamur, just take the question of dress, of how we dress, of what it means for humans to be dressed in a certain way. There's so much material in, in Dante's lyrics on, on that topic, completely unexplored critically. There's just so much. I, could, I can only begin in these essays to indicate to people, of whom I hope you will be some, directions that that one can pursue. Other questions? Yes. Okay. Behind the camera. Uh, it's a very broad question. Uh, a well-known uh, uh, Dante scholar and translator once remarked in a, a social setting that there is nothing in Dante's other works that uh, uh, presages the greatness of the divine comedy. Do you agree that there is such a discontinuity? Well, in some way, you could, I could say my entire life's work is trying to jump over that varco and, and make plausible sense in my mind as to how that happened, because it doesn't come from nowhere. Um, I, 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 you know, there are certain no, I really don't agree. When I read the Rime Petrosa, I think they're as beautiful as anything that's ever been written. I mean, I really do. I, 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 and I say this as, I don't think you could be more devoted to the Divine Comedy than I am, but I'm not going to say that there's an absolute, qua that you can never feel anything. When I read a verse like in Tre Donne, Le Viglio che mi hai dato, Onor mi tenio, how can I not hear that later Dante in a verse like that. It's not as continuously at that level. What the Commedia does is just keep at it and at it and at it. It's just amazing. And what the Commedia does is bring in so much history so that in some ways that keeps the whole thing aloft anyway. He doesn't have to do it all just on the basis of, he, he can do all those things Cecco Dascoli deplores, write for a while about Francesca, write for a while about Farinata. Um, that does provide you a lot of ballast. Um, in lyric poems, you don't have that. In lyric poems, you're really dealing, you know, with 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 your subjectivity, with ideas, and you have much less else to 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 keep you going. But I I don't think anywhere else he does it as continuously. But I wouldn't 
I wouldn't agree with it as an absolute. That's my answer. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I'm particularly interested in the sociological aspects that have been discussed. Um, say, for example, with those poems of mourning, um, with, with Dante, like you said, talking about trying, want this, expressing a desire to transgress gendered spaces. When you read that, do you have a sense that this is some kind of, um, you know, unique uh, emotion that Dante is is expressing, or that it might be a broader um, sort of social uh, value or questioning of the division of these gendered spaces, that it's like, like a broader male uh, desire. What's your name? Shannon. Shannon. It's touching on, you know, in a way, it's, it's in a way the core issue of dealing with someone like Dante, which is to what degree do we just say exceptionalism? <laughs> you know, I do my, I use history to try to create as much as I can the context to not just rush to a facile exceptionalism. And yet the truth is, I find him exceptional. <laughs> and I don't, I, I have myself not seen too many other examples, so I would never say there was nothing. I would never say there was nothing. I mean, there's all sorts of, all sorts of, of, of gender bending things in medieval literature taken. Um, taken, you know, there's, there's examples of cross-dressing, there's all sorts of stuff. In a lyric poem, I've never seen something in which a man is imagining himself to be in a space of mourning with women, but I can't say I've read everything. On the whole, I find that Dante, and this is con completely consistent with the Undivine Comedy, Dante is a transgressor. That is a hallmark of his identity. Transgressor. That's what he's all about. And what the lyrics show us is that he was, it was already a varco folle to do o voi che per la via d'amor passate. How do you put d'amor into Jeremiah like that? And you're not yet 20 years old, probably. That's pretty remarkable. So, so I, You've touched a core issue, and the answer is do your best to historicize, but he's almost always going to come out exceptional. Thank I think that. Okay. Other questions? No more? Theo, I have a request, not a question. Uh, would it be possible for you to, you, you said that you're going to have an event that is going to concentrate specifically on the translation yes. with the translator, but would you please read? to us one sonnet or one uh, poem in the English translation, just to give us a sense oh, of what it sounds idea. like. Uh, sure. Um, maybe we'll do one with, you want to read it in Italian and I'll read the English? Should we do Guido e Vorre? All right. Just a moment, I have to find the page. Here. Here no, no, here's the, no, this also has Italian in it. No, but I have it No, right, but you oh, have it here in Italian, so. Se potete nel microfono. Ok. Beh, in inglese, tu scusa. No, prima di te. Guido, io vorrei so, che tu, Lapo ed io, fossimo presi per incantamento e messi in un vasel che ad ogni vento per mare andasse al voler vostro e mio. Sì che fortuna o altro tempo rio non ci potesse dare impedimento, anzi, Vivendo sempre in un talento, di stare insieme crescesse il disio. E Monna Vanna e Monna Laggia poi, con, quello che sul nume, con quella che sul numero delle trenta, con noi ponesse il buon incantatore. E qui vi ragionar sempre d'amore, e ciascun di lor fosse contenta, sì come credo che saremo noi. So, and this is Richard Lansing's translation. Guido, I wish that Lapo, you and I, were carried off by some enchanter's spell and set upon a ship to sail the sea where every wind would favor our command, so neither thunderstorms nor cloudy skies might ever have the power to hold us back, but rather cleaving to, his sing to this single wish that our desire to live as one would grow. And Lady Vanna were with Lady Laja, born to us with her who is number 30, 
by our good enchanter's wizardry. To talk of love would be our sole pursuit, and each of them would find herself content, just as I think that we should likewise be. I, just, I picked that at random. Maybe there are some, I mean, Grace, who read the whole thing, proofed it with incredible care, ended up saying that you thought Richard's translations are poetic yeah, they're works. Beautiful. They're beautiful. They really are beautiful. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Appreciate Marilyn.